Hello, I am Peter Okwache. Welcome to Focus on Africa, our top stories. On the march, we hear from the South African women spearheading the public outcry over violence against women. It hurts every day because with rape, it's something that you cannot say, I will move on and forget. I'm looked at as a criminal. Strong words from the former South Africa president's son, Duduzane Zuma, as he denies wrongdoings in a corruption investigation. Also on the program, yet more fallout from the sex for grade scandal. Two more lecturers are suspended following BBC Africa Eye's high impact investigation into sexual harassment at two universities in West Africa. And in sport, South Africa through to the quarterfinals of the Rugby World Cup after a big win over Canada. Thanks for joining us here on Focus on Africa from BBC World News. Emotions are continuing to run high in South Africa over the safety of women with the killing of females, children and the targeting of the LGBTI community described as a national crisis by the president. There's been widespread anger and a public outcry following several high profile murders and rapes of women in the country in recent weeks. A warning that this report from Nomsama Seko in Johannesburg contains material of a sexual nature which some viewers might find disturbing. The killing of women in South Africa has ignited outrage and protests countrywide. The government says attacks on women and children are similar to those of a country at war. Crime statistics have revealed that nearly 3,000 women and 1,000 children were murdered in just the last 12 months. Many were assaulted and raped before their death. This Johannesburg woman was gang raped by three men who broke into her home. She never got justice. I'm angry, I'm upset. Yes, I'm trying so hard to move on, but when coming to our justice system and our cops, honestly, I'm so mad. It, it, it hurts every day because with rape, it's something that you cannot say, I will move on and forget. After years of trauma, she opened a rape victim center which inspired her to reclaim her life. Keep on sending the message to others. She also runs a rape awareness campaign in her neighborhood. In just the last few minutes after this campaign started, we came across a 23-year-old woman who was raped early this year but was turned away by the police. And here she is now. Tell us what happened. I was raped twice by men who are my neighbors. I fear for my life because I often see one of the two people who attacked me. I reported the matter to the police who turned me away and said I must stop causing trouble and that I should just forgive and forget. It's not easy. I've even turned to drugs as a coping mechanism. <laughs> President Cyril Ramaphosa recently announced an emergency plan to tackle gender-based violence. There is a very violent and brutal war that is underway against the women of South Africa. Despite government intervention, attacks continue unabated. Some of these things can't really be policed by uh, some of the law enforcement measures. So it needs a change of attitude from men because they are the biggest perpetrators of this scourge of violence against women. Many agree that levels of gender-based violence are unacceptable and that a solution to deal with this worrying problem must be found. Nom Samasego, BBC News, Johannesburg. Let's delve deeper into this problem now. We'll go live to Kampala and speak to Rosebel Kagomire, editor of The African Feminist. She joins me on the phone. Rosebel, why is this still such a big problem across several African countries? 
Thank you for having me. Definitely, this is not just a South African issue. It might take on different dimensions or different magnitudes in different African countries. In Uganda in particular, in the last two years, we saw a spike in killings of women, targeted killings, where most of the women had either been raped or a certain external objects inserted in their private parts. And definitely, this is not only happening in Uganda, but also we've seen in Kenya women early this year taking to the streets uh, to protest femicide. And we and many women are saying that we have to get men to be held accountable. We have to create systems right from family that are not going to continue victim shaming and silencing women because they've been silenced for far too long. Well, do you think that one of the problems is that it has become normalized within several societies that, you know, brutalizing women, even killing them in some cases, is all right? Definitely, uh, the killing is always the last point of dehumanization. We have allowed many uh, social norms that dehumanize girls in, in, in right from birth, and we need to re-examine all these social norms, but also push for policies. Governments need to take this as a crisis because if you have all these uh, people in a society who are unable to live a free life and people living in fear, young women living in fear, and increasingly young women, as we see the populations of Africa moving to cities, will see we see a rise in unsafe cities. So we need to look at policies, but also very much in shifting our social norms that uphold everyday violences against women. Well, you, you mentioned the fact that, you know, the government has to look at this as a crisis, that there have to be policies put in place to stop it. But do you think that there is the willpower within these governments to stop it? I think most governments are really preoccupied with power and keeping power and sustaining power in that the everyday realities of African citizens are then just a backdrop of what they work on. So we have, as part of the push for accountability, our governments need to be not only just accountable to women, but to the entire population. So when you have a rundown in the government accountability, definitely women and other people who hold less power in society, uh, they're going to be at the most receiving end of violence and oppression. And this goes back to government, but certainly also need to re-examine how we raise men and how men get away from the very day in our, in our, in our household, get away with so much, and we don't groom young boys to be accountable yes, and indeed, respectful. And you just took that away from me now, because I was going to ask, you know, on, on the ground, um, grassroots level, what role do men have to play? I think men have to, for far too long, programs have been targeted towards women. Women must not walk at night. You know, you must not do this. It is time to talk about the perpetrators in the culture that groom perpetrators, and men have to do that job to groom the next generation that is going to be held accountable, but also realize that protection of women has to, has to happen in this time. So we have to shift norms that really marginalize the young women because all these are connected. They are not just happening. The killing is not happening out of, out, out, out of nowhere. But okay. certainly we, we are dealing with a post-colonial, most times post-colonial violent state. Okay, Rosebel Kagomira, the editor of The African Feminist. Thank you very much for speaking to us. Thank you. Let's take a quick look now at other stories making the headlines across Africa and the rest of the world. The UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres has warned the organization could run out of money by the end of the month due to a deficit of more than $200 million. In a letter to tens of thousands of staff, Mr. Guterres suggested postponing conferences, reducing services and restricting official travel. The government of Mozambique has signed a deal with the US oil company ExxonMobil for its natural gas. According to projections, Exxon's investment in the Rovuma Basin, which is offshore in the northern part of the country, could be upwards of $33 billion. That's one of the largest ever investments on the African continent. Reports from Ethiopia say at least eight people have been killed in ethnic clashes in the state of Amhara. A local television station said the incident happened close to the Oromia regional state border. No group has claimed responsibility for, but fighters from the Oromo Liberation Front have previously been accused of attacking the area. 
According to lawyers, a court in Egypt has released 200 people arrested during protests in Cairo and other towns in September. The Egyptian Commission for Rights and Freedoms said they faced charges of protesting without permission and using social media to promote terrorism. As many as 2,865 people had faced prosecution for anti-government protests. And Rwanda has opened Africa's first smartphone manufacturing company in the capital, Kigali. Other African countries put phones together, but the Mara X and the Mara Z handsets will be completely manufactured and assembled in Rwanda. President Paul Kagame attended the opening of the plant and said he hoped it would increase the 15% smartphone usage. The University of Ghana has suspended two professors accused of sexual harassment in the BBC Sex for Grades documentary and has urged any students or staff who have suffered harassment to report it. It comes a day after a lecturer at the University of Lagos in Nigeria, Dr. Boniface Ibenegu, was also suspended from his post and as a pastor in his church. The university has shut down the cold room mentioned in the report pending investigation. Myoni Jones sent this report from outside the University of Lagos. Well, it's the day after Africa Eyes Sex for Grades documentary was aired and many of the students here at the University of Lagos are talking about it. There's a mixture of surprise, but also relief that these revelations have finally come to light. But although many students think that the evidence that was found in the documentary is going to help shift the discourse about sexual harassment here, they also fear that once the hype dies down, things will go back to normal. They should be punished. They should really be punished. So it will teach less, it will teach other lecturers in their shoes that this thing, because these people they are harassing sexually, they're actually people like their daughters. So why should this be done? It's unfair. It could utterly destroy a human being. The student might even do very well academically, might be very smart and all, but by the time the results will come out, I know you'll be seeing an F and E because they always want the student to always come back every time so they're always going to so they're always trying to feel the person every time so the person so they can have more advantage to the person that's why it's not that they're always dressing in a seductive way or anything nigeria is a corrupt country so not only just sex for whatever is being covered up there are a lot of corrupt practices are being covered up so like it's not a new thing for them to be covering things up many of the students we've spoken to here say one of the problems with lack of accountability has been the amount of power that's concentrated in the hands of the lecturers who can make or break a student's career at will. It's hoped that the university's new sexual harassment policy is going to help tackle this problem. But as it was only introduced in August, we'll have to wait to see how effective it turns out to be. Maini Jones, BBC News, Lagos. Let's discuss the wider issue with Awazi Agbalaga. She is a popular radio personality in Lagos and is also part of an NGO which campaigns on this issue called Stand to End Rape Initiative in Nigeria. Awazi, what kind of stories do students come to your NGO with? Oh, thanks for having me, first of all. But we have the most terrible stories as, as we speak, even just stories from this same lecturer, Dr. Boniface. We've gotten five more stories today and one from as far back as 1999 they're really gruesome some of them uh, some of them are really really brutal because students will tell you some of them have been full on violently raped by their lecturers in their offices within the school premises and nobody can just help them and what do you then do to challenge such behavior within the university campuses well, to be fair, Stand to End Rape is one organization, and I'm very sure there are other organizations that are trying to help. We make sure that all our survivors get the, the counseling they need. However, there's only so much you can do to fight for a student when the institution itself is not wired to protect a student. Like you said, the University of Lagos specifically has just um, introduced the sexual harassment policy in August. So this whole time, in all universities and in all institutions, I would say, in Nigeria, by the time you go in you see so many posters and instructions to students don't dress this way don't dress that way but there's very little telling you what to do when a lecturer is harassing you so when you want to report there there's just so much that is at stake for the student reporting is so much harder even if you decide to report how much justice are you going to get the student starts to think oh my god I'm going to be victimized 
other lecturers are going to fail me because it's, it's the truth of the matter that as much as lecturers are harassing students, there are other lecturers that are friends with these lecturers and are aware, well aware. So okay. another I, I lecturer must, might I, not I must, be harassing you. Let me just cut you. in here. I mean, I must say that uh, Dr. Boniface Ibenegu um, has denied yes. these allegations. But you mentioned the policies in place at the University of Lagos to stop yes. such behavior. The problem then is implementation, isn't it? It is. Implementation is a big problem. We need to see, and um, apart from implementation being a big problem, going through the University of Lagos sexual harassment policy, you see that there is no clause in there that protects the student who reports. And we are aware that the student who reports has so much at stake. There are other lecturers who might victimize them because they're a snitch or they don't, they're just not, you know, they're just going to be victimized. So they haven't protected the student. That's one that has just been newly introduced. And what about the other institutions across the country? This is a big menace, right? And this documentary has just brought it to limelight. And so many other people are trying to now address it. Like Babcock University has put out a statement. They're asking people to report. And, you know, other people are going forward with it. However, what's more important to stand to end rape myself? and a bunch of other people is that we have the prohibition of sexual harassment in tertiary institutions bill passed. Okay. This has been in motion since 2016. It was pushed back by ASU. We did not get it passed. And now we're hopeful that this documentary resurrects the conversation and we get to move it so that it could be passed, so that it becomes a criminal offense to sexually harass students in okay. universities. All right. Awazi Agbalaga from the um, Stand to End Rape Initiative in Nigeria. Thank you very yes. much for talking to us here on Focus Thank Lab. You. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And you can watch the full hour-long Africa Eye documentary on the BBC Africa YouTube channel. This is Focus on Africa from BBC World News with me, Peter Okwacha. Still to come on the program, we speak to Crystal Palace and Ivory Coast International Wilfred Zaha on a failed summer transfer move and more. I'm Peter Okwacha. Welcome back. I'm looked at as the face of corruption. Strong testimony from Duduzani Zuma, son of former President Jacob Zuma, during day two of a corruption inquiry. The investigation revolves around the Zuma's dealings with the powerful Gupta family. All parties have always denied any wrongdoing. Milton and Kosi has more from Johannesburg. It's been two days of giving evidence here by Dutuzane Zuma. But like father, like son, the young Mr. Zuma denied every single corruption allegation brought against him. And today, he had this to say to the South African public. I'm looked at as a criminal. I'm looked at as this face of corruption. Um, this guy that's plundered trillions out of this country, which is not the case, by the way. Um, you know, so I'd just like to, to say to the public out there, I'm not corrupt. I'm not taking any money from anybody. I never have, and I never will. Um, how they take it, that's, that's not for me to decide. But I just want to make that clear. So when you see me walking around, you know, just know that I, it's, it's not me. But the judge is in search of the truth. I just want the public to know that um, we are looking at everything. We are looking at every, every, everything. We, we don't have a version that we want to be proved. We just want the truth. And um, wherever we might uh, get the evidence. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Yes. And that brought us to the end of Mr. Zuma's testimony. But we are a long way away from prosecutions. The judge will continue in search of the truth well into next year. Milton Nkosi, BBC News, at the State Capture Commission in Johannesburg. You're watching BBC Focus on Africa. It's now time for some sports, and Mimi, you've got a lot. I do. I have a lot today, Peter. Thank you. We begin with South Africa, who have produced a dazzling first-half display as they confirm their place in the World Cup quarterfinals with a big win over 14-man Canada, beating them 66-7. to The Springboks ran in seven tries in the first half with scrum half Cobus Reinach notching the earliest hat-trick in a World Cup game after 20 minutes. Coach Razi Erasmus' side go top of Pool B for now with defending champions New Zealand expected to take the spot when they play later this week. Yes, I think we learned a lot. 
But again, the moment your decision making gets cut down about with quick line speed and pressure and, and quarter finals, semi finals, things change, you know. So um, there was some really nice, good things to see. I thought our lineouts again. I think we haven't lost the lineout ball so far in, in the in the World Cup again with Skulk playing hooker this this game. So I think we're in a good position when it comes to personnel. But from now on, it counts for nothing. You know, if you lose the next game, you're out of here. So so we must prepare really well. Moving on to football, Wilfred Zaha says his head was a bit all over the place at the beginning of the season. The Crystal Palace winger handed in a transfer request when Everton and Arsenal were keen on signing him over the summer. But before we got to that, he began by telling me about him picking up an award at the Best of Africa event, which took place on Sunday. It was for his charity work in the Ivory Coast, where he gives 10% of his wages to charitable causes. To be honest, I have to thank my mum mainly because she pushed me to do it. And obviously, like I said before, when I got the award, I'm very family orientated. The main thing is it's from the heart and I do it for my country. So yeah, that's all that matters to me. I'm just a normal guy who's managed to make it from nothing. We saw over the summer your failed move to Everton and as well you splitting with your agent. How, what was going through at that time and how has that affected you? Have you settled in now this season? Whatever happened, the reason why I had to put my head down and just play my football, because one, I would be hindering my own progress by moaning and whatever. I moan anyway, but moaning and not wanting to, to, to perform properly, that would just be messing myself up, and two, I have too much respect for my manager, the fans, and my teammates to, to treat them in that way. So it was the thing where, okay, this hasn't happened, but I've got to get on with it. And I've got to prove every time that I'm the top player I claim to be. All I can do is just perform on the pitch. And that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to be consistent, perform on the pitch. Week in, week out, I've got my own goals that I've set for myself. Last season, I set myself 10 goals. Well, double digits, but I managed to get 10 goals, so I was happy. So hopefully, I can reach my goals again, and that's, that's all that's on my mind, really. Here in the English Premier League, your fellow Ivorian teammate, Nicolas Pepe, is at Arsenal. There's been a lot of pressure on him to perform. How do you think he's going to fare this season? I see, I see the social media, I see everything, and it's a thing where he needs time. He's come from another league, he's young. There's that price tag that he has not put on himself. People put that on him because of his performances. So you've got to give him time for him to reproduce that. It's not going to come like that. Like, so me, I've got nothing but faith in him. I've got confidence that he will, he will produce the same thing that he did before because we, we both play for Ivy Coast. I've seen the talent he's got, but not everyone sees it. So I feel like just give him a bit of time and then you'll see that same Pepe that you saw in the French League. More from my interview with Zaha later on in the week. Nigeria's women's captain, Asisad Oshwala, has described the Super Falcons' early exit from the 2020 Olympic Games as heartbreaking. The African champions were knocked out on the away goals rule after drawing one all with Ivory Coast in Lagos on Monday. The nine-time continental champions were keen to return to the competition event after missing out on the 2012 and 2016 Olympic tournaments. And finally, Brazil are preparing to face Senegal for the first time on Thursday in Singapore. Brazil's assistant coach Kleber Xavier believes that the Taranga Lions will provide a good opposition for the five-time world champions who just managed to defeat Cameroon 1-0 last November. Brazil will be looking at this match as an attempt to build ahead of next year's World Cup qualifier and 2020 Copa America. They're also facing Nigeria next. And that's all the sport, Peter. Great stuff, Mimi. And that's it on Focus in Africa for today. Thanks for watching. We'll see you again very soon. Goodbye.